might know this is Claire and this is Michael, it's not the other way around. This is not Claire. Anyway, here's the thing. When Claire was a younger person, and she was once, um, she came down to where we live now, in the middle of Devon, and was on holiday down here. Every single holiday, she loved it so much, she came back and back and back and back and back and back. Uh, and she had this wonderful time, and I'm gonna get her to talk about it, because then I, I took over the story making, but she actually did the story when she was seven years old. So imagine if you can look at Claire, think of her as seven years old, and she'll tell you what she did when she came down to Hiddesley. Over to you. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Um, I came down to Devon when I was seven. I came on my own. Um, I came by train, and I was picked up at a station which now is closed, and was driven through empty countryside for miles with no cars. It was a different world, really a different world, and I fell in love with it at first sight. And I've never fall out of love with it. I just find this little tiny area just bliss. And uh, when I married Michael and he seemed to think it'd be a good idea that we came down together and set up a project to bring other children here to enjoy the things that I had enjoyed as a child. And then this book came out of that. And when Claire was little, there was a lovely old man keeping the pub. There was a man called Sean Rafferty and he used to stay in the pub. And Sean Rafferty became like a granddaddy to Claire. We loved each other very much indeed. And uh, when we started the project and had the children to come to stay here and stay here, he came to live on the farm um, with his wife Peggy, and uh, we all sort of, in a way, lived together um, with this little project. And he was a poet, wonderful poet. And he wrote a poem about this place, about the hill we're speaking to you from in Devon. From here about hill. From here about hill, the sun early rising looks over his fields where a river runs by at the green of the wheat and the green of the barley and candlelight meadow, the pride of his eye. The clock on the wall strikes eight in the kitchen. The clock in the parlour says 20 to nine. The thrush has a song and the blackbird another. The weather reporter says cloudless and fine. It's green by the hedge and white by the pear tree. In here about village, the date is today. It's seven by the sun, and the time is the springtime, the first of the month, and the month must be May. A small dragon. I found a small dragon in the woodshed. Think it must have come from deep inside a forest because it's damp and green and leaves are still reflecting in its eyes. I feed it on many things, dry grass, the roots of stars, hazelnut and dandelion. But it stared up at me as if to say, I need food you can't provide. It made a nest among the coal and unlike a bird's nest, larger. It's out of place here and most times silent. If you believed in it, I would come hurrying to your house to let you share this wonder. But I want instead to see if you yourself will pass this way. What happens very often is, as we'll talk about it a bit, is um, I do write my stories from um, other people's notions. And in fact, the whole, whole purpose of this book, Where My Well Is Take Me, is a story of Claire's walk through the countryside, which she suggested to me. And I turned into a story. She chose the poems to go around it. That was how the book worked. And A Small Dragon by Brian Patton was the inspiration for another little story of mine called Mimi and the Mountain Dragon. Um, I've never written a book about a dragon before. I may never write another one again. But I so loved that poem. I thought, well, maybe, maybe I could do a little dragon story. So I did. Set in a different shed in a different country. So a small dragon has soaked into both of us. We love it. I think really, I mean, I was a teacher for years and years and years. And to me, the most important thing for a child is that he, she finds a way to express themselves, to tell the, the world, to themselves really, about how they feel about the world about them. And finding your own voice to do this, finding the confidence to write it down, beginning your once upon a time or however it's going to begin, and then just telling it down without fear, without worry, without worrying about spelling or punctuation. Just telling it down seems to me to be so important because speaking out 
what we love, what we fear. And at the moment, we're going through all sorts of rather turbulent thoughts in our head and difficulties. So the more we tell it out, the better it is um, for our contentment, really, uh, for our well-being. And poetry does this. And then when you read other people's poetry, you get an insight into other people's lives and other people's takes. And that's very, very important because then you don't feel so alone. It's any, any book you read, whether it's a story or a poem, the wonderful thing about it is that you enter into someone else's world, which means you escape from your own. And we, we quite like to do that from time to time. I think the children sometimes think, well, this is really what you do at school and you get marked for it. Well, it's not. That's one, one way we come at poetry, but it's actually you being quiet with your head, looking, feeling, thinking, tasting, it's your senses coming down onto the page. And then it's discovering the music in the words. As you tell them, you realize what works on it, and then you read it out loud, and it comes alive off the page. So when we came to put this book together, she took her favorite poems, and you'll find them in here. And one or two of mine crept in. I had to fight for the space, but one of them is this, The Way Through the Woods. It's by Rudyard Kipling. They shut the road through the woods 70 years ago. Weather and rain have undone it again, and now you would never know there was once a road through the woods before they planted the trees. It is underneath the coppice and the heath and the thin anemones. Only the keeper sees that where the ring dove broods and the badgers roll at ease, there was once a road through the woods. Yet, if you enter the woods of a summer evening late, when the night air cools on the trout ringed pools, where the otter whistles his mate, they fear not men in the woods because they see so few. You will hear the beat of a horse's feet and the swish of a skirt in the dew, steadily cantering through the misty solitudes as though they perfectly knew the old lost road through the woods, but there is no road through the woods. This is a, a very, very favorite poem of mine and something I've always felt and believed. So it's, it's a little bit like a mantra really. It's called Hurt No Living Thing. It's by Christina Rossetti. Hurt No Living Thing. Ladybird nor butterfly, nor moth with a dusty wing, nor cricket chirping cheerily, nor grasshopper so light a leap, nor dancing gnat, nor beetle fat, nor harmless worms that creep. My poem is a silly poem now, um, because we need some silliness in our lives, do we not? A bit. A bit. The Frog by Anon. What a wonderful bird the frog are. When he stand, he sit almost. When he hop, he fly almost. He ain't got no sense hardly. He ain't got no tail hardly either. When he sit, he sit on what he ain't got. Almost. We used to get too close to a bird's nest to look in to see if there are any eggs, which you sort of mustn't do because you can put them off their nest. But nonetheless, the, the, there's something so um, exciting about discovering a blackbird's nest or a, a robin's nest. And of course, the great thing to do is to stand back and to watch the parent bird coming in, feeding and feeding and feeding, and then the fledgings flying. You can see all that. It, it's wonderful that children can do this sort of thing, especially at the moment. So when you do get a chance to look out of your window um, and, and, and look at the trees, you're going to have longer to look at them. Um, and when you go out for your half, hour, half an hour's walk, whatever it is that you can do at the moment, um, again, just don't just walk and play, have a good look, have a good look, and see what you can find. What I used to do when I was a teacher, I used to take my kids out, I used to love this, I'd take my class out before they ever wrote a word. Um, and we'd, we'd, we'd go out into the fields um, or into the park. Uh, and, We'd sit by, by, a, by a lake or by a stream, and I tell them all be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Just listen, just look, and um, they'd make a few little notes on a bit of paper, 
and walk back to school without talking. That's very important so that the thought of it and the sight of it is still in your head and clear. And then you sit down and then you write them straight down and illustrate it as well. There's all sorts of ways you can do this. Don't cry, Caterpillar. Caterpillar, don't cry. You'll be a butterfly. Bye and bye. Caterpillar, please don't worry about a thing. But, said Caterpillar, will I still know myself in wings? And now a very different sort of poem. Again, a bit of fun, really. I saw a jolly hunter with a jolly gun walking in the country in the jolly sun. In the jolly meadow sat a jolly hare, saw the jolly hunter, took jolly care. Hunter, jolly eager sight of jolly prey, forgot gun pointing wrong jolly way. Jolly hunter, jolly head, over heels gone, jolly old safety catch, not jolly on. Bang went the jolly gun, hunter, jolly dead, jolly hair, got clean away, jolly good, I said. You've heard Claire, Claire's told you about her time in the countryside when she was young. I think um, that was the beginning of it. A lot of things that happen in your life happen in the first place because you're really, really fixed on something when you're young. And she loved the countryside. She loved the little lanes around here in Devon. It's why we're living here now. And it's certainly why we started this project 45 years ago, Farms for City Children. In those 45 years, um, since she began it and we worked together with local farmers and the teachers who came down. We've had over a hundred thousand children now come to stay on a, one of our three farms, one here in Devon, uh, Nethercott we call it, and one up in Wales near St David's called Treguinis, and one at Wick Court in Gloucestershire. And the children come from primary schools all over the country. There may be some people looking in today who have there been, are. I hope there are who've been an awful lot of people have come. Some of them now are quite old, not as old as we are, but they're old. And um, they've been here. And here's the thing. They don't just come with clipboards and have a look and go away for a day. They come for a week. They stay on the place. And they become farmers, effectively, for a week. They work alongside real farmers, alongside their teachers. At about 35 at a time from primary schools, year four, five, six, um, and from all over the country. And we work alongside them. And Claire and I did that for years and years and years. It's now run by younger people who are much better at it. But the principle is still the same. It's immersing yourself in the countryside you become the farmers for the week you become responsible for the animals so you help with the lambing you help with the cleaning out cleaning out you help with the picking up of eggs all the things that claire did when she was seven so um, at the end of march the last children got on the bus and left the all three farms we had children coming in on all three farms from christmas till till march the 20th and then we were closed down and it stayed closed. So the farms are all empty, which is sad in itself because it's been a beautiful spring and there have been no children to enjoy it with us. We've had lambs born, chicks hatching, calves being born, vegetable garden completely grown with amazing vegetables, all these things which the children normally would have been involved with and they're not here. And it looks like they're not going to be able to come back for probably another six, eight months, probably. And in the meantime, we've got to keep the, th the three farms going. We've got to keep feeding the animals. We've got to look after the, the, the vegetable garden. We've got to do everything to keep it all going. We've, kept, we've got a skeleton staff. A lot of the staff have been furloughed. And uh, we've got a skeleton staff. And we are really working our socks off to raise the money to keep it all going until the children can come back. And what is so important about what we do is that when the children can come back, they were going to need us more than ever. Because what we have discovered that the the most disadvantaged children have really, really thrived on what we offer. Their self-confidence has grown, their anxieties disappear, they make friends, they learn to do things they never thought they would, they, they, learn, they stop being fearful. Um, so we must be here, we've got to be here for them when they can come back. And they're learning about their world, their, their, the countryside, nature. They see close to stuff they've never seen before. They see buzzards mewing up in the air, flying up high in the sun. They see larks, they see herons down by the river, they see the salmon leaping in the river. They're lucky. They're lucky. And they see the flowers and they get close to these, just as Claire did when she was seven or eight years old. And in a way, it's because she did it really. I'm going to have to speak for her because I think she feels that this is every child's right to, to be able 
to be out in the countryside. So it's a charity. It's not a business. It's not something anyone makes money out of. Um, and obviously, it's going to be very important to be able to raise the funds to keep it all going. Like a lot of charities all over the country at the moment, like a lot of businesses all over the country, um, it's going to be hard time. So we're going to do our very best to keep going. So in a few months' time, the first children coming back to Nethercock or to Guinness or Wick will get off the coach and they'll have their farming clothes on and their wellies on and they'll go where their wellies take them. That's what this whole thing's all been about for 45 years and 100,000 children. Um, I went to a school in London, grew up in London, um, just after the Second World War. And I went to a little school called uh, St Cuthbert's with St Matthias, which is in uh, Earl's Court, that sort of region of London, West London. And what's really lovely, do you know, is it's um, there still, and the children come down to the farms now. The children from that school come down uh, and spend their week on a farm every year. And I, I love that. I love the fact that it's, it's become circular. So those children now are getting a glimpse of the countryside. And do you know, when I was a little thing, I did something very new at one point. I acted in my first play in the school hall at St. Matthias when I was about six, which is quite a long time. And we did a play of a poem which I love and it's in this book and it's called The Owl and the Pussycat and I bet you know it some of you and if you do know it and it's in your head um, you can say it along with me because it's quite fun and I played the owl in The Owl and the Pussycat um, and I was brilliant. The Owl and the Pussycat by Edward Lear the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh, lovely pussy, oh pussy, my love. What a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are. What a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried. But what shall we do for the ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there in a wood, a piggy wig stood with a ring at the end of his nose, his nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said the piggy, I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mints and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon, the moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. The years at the spring, the days at the morn. Mornings at seven, the hillsides dew pearled. The larks on the wing, the snails on the thorn. God's in his heaven. All's right with the world. And it will be. And it will be.